the first time spring. <laughs> Will you stand for the reading from God's prophet Isaiah? Our song of anticipation this morning is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. It's number 211. We'll sing the first three verses. shines in the east. I like the stable for man and beast. We are the angels. Old and bright, we led everyone to Jesus that night. Strong as 
still. Before the only son I kneel. <coughs> I am the donkey, soft and gray. I carried his mother from far away. Shepherds who watch the sheep. Tonight the holy watch will keep.
than Jesus, did anybody else, um, we were preparing for Jesus' birthday, does anybody else have a birthday or an anniversary to celebrate this week? D. D? What is second? D is 22 or D? <laughs> 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 no, second. One or two. Anybody else this week? A birthday or an anniversary to celebrate? That's next week. Yeah, next week. That's true. Brenda's birthday is when? Brenda's is the 22nd? 22nd. 22nd also. Okay. Excellent. We celebrate Jesus' birthday. And Mary Agnes is the 22nd? Wow. It's a big day. Let's sing to them. Happy birthday.
So Stephanie, what do you do? January. January the 9th. Boy or girl? Boy. We have a name picked out? Adrian. Adrian. Mm -hmm. Friends, hear this call to love from the psalmist this morning. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant, David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Will you join us in our liturgy for the lighting of this fourth heaven candle? New life is coming. We will all be changed by the language of love. Today we light the candle of love. We give thanks for God's steadfast love. Friends, let's stand and sing. Love came down at Christmas. It's number 242. <laughs> Help us, replied the squirrel. 
Then the three animals disappear into the fall. Can you see them? I wonder what they mean, said the bear. But he was very sleepy, so he laid his head on the lamb's back and fell asleep, thinking about it. Then he had a dream. Okay, so he's going to dream this rest. Above, a very poor stable shone the star. Its light slipped through the opening onto the child laying in a manger. How astonished the bear was to suddenly see the squirrel leaping joyfully around the laughing child. The bird sang, and the hare kept time with his ears. The little bear woke from his dream. Little lamb, he said, I saw the squirrel, the bird, and the hare in a dream, and they were all healthy. Rested, they cheerfully went on their way. So they're getting closer and closer, aren't they? Okay. Let's all say a prayer together. Well, let's do our open our door first. So who can find the 18? Okay, let's see what's behind that store. The lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. May you be blessed by this reading of God's Word. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. When Mary, his mother, was engaged to Joseph, before they were married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Because he didn't want to humiliate her, he decided to call off their engagement quietly. As he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. A virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did just as an angel from God commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he didn't have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son. Joseph called him Jesus. On the Christmas 
Eve night when I was six years old. My four-year-old brother and I made a plan. After the lights in our room were turned out, we whispered in the dark, concocting our scheme. It was well thought out, very detailed, and we had contingencies just in case. With much thought and deliberation, we settled on the Christmas morning plan. The first one to awake would lay still in the bed and listen, listening, hoping to hear silence. If there was no noise in the house, no one stirring, no one shuffling, and no noise from the roof, nothing stomping, nothing snorting, then the first one would wake up the other. Then together, we would listen some more, just to be sure. When we were convinced that all was quiet, all was calm, we would gently get out of bed and crawl down the long hallway from our bedroom to the living room, slipping past our younger sister's room, silently sliding past our parents' room, crawling all the way to the living room. In silent darkness, we would stealthily rise up and peer over the sofa to see if Santa had come. That was our plan. I woke on Christmas morning to my brother standing over me, shaking me. Santa's come! Santa's come! How do you know, I asked. Because I looked, he said. And I jumped out of bed with him. And together we began running down the hall, only to hear, boys, get back in bed. That was my father. But Santa's come, we exclaimed. <coughs> Our two-year-old sister is now standing with us in the hallway amidst all that commotion. Go back to your room, we were told. We'll be there in a moment. And so we went back to our room and patiently waited. Mom and Dad did come, and they escorted the three of us down the hall to the living room, where we could see the tree was glistening in the dim light, under which we knew were presents and around those we hoped were presents that Santa had brought. Mom and Dad escorted us down that long walk towards that living room, all of that energy and excitement, and then turned us into the kitchen. In the kitchen, we gathered around the table, the kitchen table, and my father picked up his Bible, and my mother struck a match, and she began lighting the candles of our home Advent rate. When she got to the fresh white candle in the center, my dad began reading, Look, do not be afraid, for I bring you tidings of great joy, wonderful news for all people. For today in the city of David your <coughs> Savior, who is the Christ, the Lord, is born. I wonder what my parents were thinking putting the Christ candle between me and Santa Claus. <coughs> Recently, I was talking with some young parents or some parents of young children, and they were lamenting the difficulty this time of year in getting the kids to uh, focus on Jesus. One said that when they asked the children about what was the purpose of Christmas, what was the real meaning of Christmas, the response was, Santa comes. So we talked about how children have a hard time with abstract <coughs> concepts, and they need concrete things. Seeing is believing. And we also talked about how Santa Claus is a, a good example and role model for children and adults on Chris, Christian values and virtues. There's the obvious thing, right? I mean, there are certain behavioral expectations. Santa teaches us not to be naughty, but to be... Nice. nice, yes. Which includes being kind and respectful and compassionate and loving and patient. He expects us to be like that. And that's pretty consistent with what we're taught as Christians, right? These are behaviors we try to emulate from Jesus. And then, of course, there's grace. Because although we know what it is we're supposed to do, sometimes, occasionally, maybe very rarely, we make mistakes. And children of all ages have moments. Santa recognizes that we're not perfect and are in need of grace. And who does that sound like? Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. God is the God of second chances. And Santa Claus extends those too. 
<laughs> Santa Claus is generous. Cleaning, tithing, care of widows and orphans in the Old Testament. Jesus picks up that message in which being generous and giving all that we can to those in need is at the very heart of our Christian gospel. And there's probably no one more generous than Santa Claus. <coughs> Santa is all of these things to all people. As Jesus teaches us that everyone is welcome, whether it's at the communion table or the dinner table, so Santa embodies that as well. Traveling all over the world, regardless of nationality or color or language or even religion, everyone, everyone is welcome to receive the gift of Christmas. The challenge, and I think this is what our parents sometimes, our, younger, our parents of younger children are struggling with sometimes, is the increasing secularization of Christmas. That puts a lot of pressure on kids and their parents. And many of us, even older adults, wrestle with this as Christmas continues to be more and more commercialized and less and less religious. Some people understandably get drawn into the, the culture wars around Christmas, and we can expend a lot of energy arguing and fighting about these things. Some of us get upset about the use of Xmas versus Christmas in writing. Recall, though, that the language of origin for the New Testament is Greek. And in Greek, the letter Chi, from which Christ is, comes, is represented by what we would say is an X. Christos in the New Testament is, begins with a, what looks like an X. So the original Christians would have said or written Christmas as Xmas. Some of us get upset and, and agitated over the use of the uh, politically correct Happy Holidays versus Merry Christmas. And sad as it is, it's the reality, I think, is that Merry Christmas these days conjures up for most folks images not of the manger, but of the mall. And Happy Holidays is actually derived from two old English words. You know what they are, right? Holidays comes from holy days. So it's kind of a trick on the politically correct folks. When you tell them happy holidays, you're actually wishing them happy holidays. And then, of course, there's the annual fight over nativities in the public space. Our neighbors over in Blackstone have gotten caught up in this one, this Advent season. A complaint was made about the nativity in Midtown Blackstone in Sea Park. And so in the uh, course of the um, letters to the editor of the Courier Record, post on Facebook, Comments made at town council, it seemed like everyone was decrying how the atheists are ruining Christmas. Yet I noticed in the social media debate that someone was asking this question. They would post this response and ask this question of everyone who demanded that the nativity be kept in the public park. And the reply was something like this. He first observed, you know that there's no prohibition on nativities on private land. And then he would ask, do you have a nativity in your front line? I was curious, so yesterday Julie and I took a little stroll as we were coming back from Richmond, um, from, the, from the county line at the river to the, to the corner of Fairview and Longview and most of the space in between. I think we found two nativities one of which is outside in front of the church. <laughs> Just saying. So friends, we're nearing the, the conclusion of Advent. We're entering our fourth week as we move towards Christmas. We've been getting ready for Christ now for several weeks. From Mark's gospel, recall that we listened to and heard once again John the Baptist called an admonition to us to change our hearts and change our lives, to make Jesus the most important thing in our lives and then to live like it. In Luke, we heard God's messengers say repeatedly, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid of the life-changing transformation that's taking place around you. You are part of something that's much bigger than yourself. And today in Matthew, we are given what may be the most meaningful and realistic Advent message. Joseph is a good person good person, a righteous person, the Bible says. But he's struggling with a real world problem. His fiance is pregnant, and it's not his child. 
Now, by law in the first century, he could turn her in. And most likely what would happen to her was that she would be executed. She'd be stoned to death. And to be honest with you, this is what was the custom. This is what was expected. This is what the community culture expected Joseph to do. He was being pressured by the community to act that way. He could, and this is what the scripture says he's wrestling with, try to quietly dissolve the engagement and send her and her baby, just send them on their way. If he chooses this, his reputation is going to take a big hit. Because his friends and his family and his people at church and the people in the neighborhood and the community, community are going to criticize him for not punishing her in accordance with the normal. Joseph is under a lot of social pressure to conform. And I think we can appreciate that, especially this time of year. See, that's a real world problem. And that's what's on Joseph's mind when he goes to sleep. When Joseph woke up, that's what the scripture says. When Joseph woke up, they may be the four most powerful words of Advent. When Joseph woke up, when he came to his senses, he understood that God was giving him an opportunity that would never come his way again. God was giving him the opportunity to be a parent, not only to provide for the physical needs of this child, but to be the one who taught him those morals and those values, to be a good and faithful person, to be nice and polite and considerate and loving, to teach him to be extravagantly generous, and to be welcoming and accepting of all people. To be full of grace. To set an example for this child of what it means to be graceful, forgiving, and tolerant, and understanding. When Joseph woke up and came to his senses, he put aside the expectations of family and friends, the judgmental community. He put it all aside, even the traditional response. He put it aside opting instead to do something that was life-giving. When Joseph woke up, he put God first. Fifty years ago this week, my mother and father were not putting the Christ back in Christmas. Rather, they were doing everything that they could as parents to ensure that Christ was at the center of everything. They were making sure that Christ was at the center of our lives as a family, as people of faith, even in the midst of the pressures of Christmas to be like Santa <coughs> and to remember Santa Claus, that Jesus Christ came first. So friends, this morning my counsel to you parents, whether your children are three or 33 or 53, is to make Jesus the center of your Christmas celebration. This is the most important day in the life of the church. And as Christians, it should be the most important day in your life too. Emmanuel, God comes to be with us in Christmas. Love comes down at Christmas. <coughs> As the most important day of your life, it calls for us to worship God. So if you want to challenge the, the prevailing culture, if you want to do your part to, to keep Christ in the center of Christmas, to set an example for the community, then I invite you, I encourage you, I challenge you to be in church on Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day. Do not do not be afraid to tell your family and friends that church is the most important place for you to be for those two hours. Because Jesus is the most important thing in your life. When Joseph woke up and realized what was at stake, not just for his family, but for generations to come, he did the right thing. 
He was obedient to God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I didn't have to ask for that until I saw it. say this while I'm thinking about thank you. Um, our, our Christmas weekend celebrations here are 5 o'clock on Christmas Eve. Um, we'll be at Williams Church at 9.30 on Christmas morning. We'll be here at 11 a.m. on Christmas morning. But I want you to be in church wherever it's most convenient and comfortable for you at those times. If you're with family in Blackstone, then I want you to go to church in Blackstone. If you're with family in Dinwiddie, I want you to go to church in Dinwiddie. Wherever you are, Find a church to go to on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for this day, this opportunity to come and, and to worship you. And to recognize that uh, you are the most important thing in our lives. We thank you that we can come to this safe space. And we're mindful this morning that not all across the globe are so fortunate. We pray this morning for those who face persecution for their religion, for their beliefs, those who are threatened, those who are harmed. And we pray that you will not only give them hope and peace and joy and love in this season, but that you will pray, provide for them a means for worshiping you, that they can do so without fear. Do not fear, you tell us, your messenger <coughs> Holy God, we pray for the world torn apart by war, and especially this day, we lift up to you the people of Aleppo and Syria and Yemen. Displaced from home. Their cities destroyed. Families torn apart by violence and death and destruction. Lord, in your mercy, hear their prayers and ours. We pray for peace in this season. Real peace to come to war-torn and conflict-ridden nations around the world. Lord, we pray for our nation that in this time of political transition that you continue to provide wisdom and guidance to our leaders, that your values be instilled in them, that your faith be important to them, that may they recognize that you are the most important thing in life, and may they honor that by their lives. Holy God, we pray for this community and the churches here. We pray, pray that you will continue to renew us all. That you will continue to send us the people that nobody else wants. And that our hearts and our doors will be open to receive them and love on them and provide to them what they need. Holy God, this day as we gather, we lift up to you those who are on our hearts and minds, especially those that we have named in our prayer list, the American military that poured overseas. Audrey Smith, those who are lonely and depressed in this season. Charles Arthur, Tom and Linda Dunlap, Lloyd and Becky Stone, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Margaret Smith and Randy <coughs> Carter and Lisa Watkins, for Thelma Fallen, for Dawn Bacon, for Susan Mosley and Jean Keeley, for Margaret Wilkerson, Lord, hear our prayers. We pray this morning for Ray Seamster, Caroline West, Ashby Murray, for Thelma Love, Richard and Claire Hammond, Dorothy Driscoll, Keith Purvis and Donnie Gentry, and Gwen Elliott, Lord, you know their needs better than us. We pray for the G family. For Charles Arthur, Gail Balter, Pam Foster. We pray for Harold Springer and those we name silently before you now. Hear us, O Holy God, as we come together, united people of faith, to pray the prayer that your Son, our Lord Jesus, taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation. Friends, let us 
continue our response to God's word this morning with the giving of our time and offerings. For the
here this morning, especially all of our guests that came to, uh, to see the children um, tell the story and to put Christ first in their lives this morning. We've had some extra special guests with us throughout the worship service, and I invite Santa Claus to come on up front and to bring his friend the Grinch. <laughs>